I just realized I haven't like recorded or done an intro in a very long time and now I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. <laughs> And welcome back to another Supercoach video with me, JD. You're joining me for the 2023 preseason, and we're kicking off a little bit early, but this is a perfect time to get into it. The draft's been done, and one of the most important things when it comes to our Supercoach side is, of course, rookies. And that's why Ed is our expert joining us today to kind of break down the draft as well as talk to the players that we should be starting to put on our preseason watch lists ready and ahead of next year, as well as starting to go through how we evaluate and think about the types of rookies that we look for that. Can really be successful and set up your super coach team for a great year. Ed, how are you going? Yeah, not bad, mate. Uh, it's been a really long year, especially you know going through all the draft and all that. But uh, yeah, f finally got done and dusted last week, and yeah, I can finally relax. Really, don't have to stress about it, and uh, especially for the kids as well who got drafted. I mean, they're finally at an AFL club, and now they get to see what footy is really all about. And I'm sure a lot of the two Ks that have been going around, they're finally. Yeah, figuring out the hard work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're quickly figuring out that what worked at juniors maybe doesn't necessarily translate to the senior level. They might have to kick it up a gear. Um, now, for those that don't know Ed, uh, so very well known, I guess, amongst like the footy community, uh, especially on Twitter and Big Footy. He's uh, been a writer for Rookie Me Central, which is one of the best resources for draft power rankings and content. I've already seen stuff, I think, ready up for next year as well. Um, and he's just uh, started as a talent scout for the Oakley Chargers, which is, of course, really exciting. We might dig into that a little bit. Um, if you haven't seen his work, you can follow Ed on Twitter at edpasco underscore RMC, or he goes by EDPS on Big Footy. Um, now, before we jump into, I guess, the draft itself, uh, really keen to learn a little bit more about you and your journey, Ed. So um, can you share with us how you got into player scouting and was it something you kind of always were interested in and aspired to? Uh, I'd say it started to, I started to get an interest in the draft as a whole when a, a teammate of mine for all my junior football was going into the AFL draft in Cam O'Shea, who ended up getting drafted by Port Adelaide. So I pretty much wanted to know where he'd go. So I've, you know, I've played juniors with him my, my whole, my whole junior life and just, you know, I was, then I got really keen and, oh, geez, someone I played footy with is going to be playing AFL. So yeah, I just want to watch them and see how they go. So, so yeah, I just. Then I started to look at the draft a lot. I'd just read up on all the phantom drafts that would ever go up. And uh, it wasn't until 20, uh, I'll say 2015 that I was starting to really watch, you know, other games. And then 2016 was the first time that I actually did any sort of like content and going to games and actually getting a good sense of, of all that. And in 2017 is when I got... Uh, got picked up by Pete Williams, who's uh, you know, pretty much the boss of all you know, Rookie Me Central. Uh, he's uh, He also has a big footy uh, account called Pie for Life. Uh, so he saw the, all the work I'd put down on, on big footy and said, yeah, we could really use, use uh, what you do because we think you do pretty well at all this. And yep, I was more than happy to do that. And yeah, I've been them, with them you know, since since this year and I mean it's been a good pretty good um good journey with them. But yeah, now going over to Oakley and doing that kind of stuff. So uh even though it's not you know, I'm not going through the whole main draft when doing stuff for Oakley, it's still to do with junior pathways, which is another thing that I started to really gather in the last decade or so. Uh my old man was a a, a did a lot of coaching uh, for junior football and that's something I wanted to kind of aspire to be so I would help him out at junior level and uh, I just found it really rewarding just seeing younger players develop and what I could in, like teach them and just seeing them use it and go higher and higher uh, and now when I think of what I can do in identifying talent so now I can also identify younger talent and also help them you know strive to be AFL players. It's really interesting, that kind of natural progression of having a friend and kind of, you know, finding it interesting and then developing there into this hobby that's now turning into a career for you. Um, so being picked up by Oakley Chargers is really exciting. How did that specifically come about? And then what will you work look like 
uh, for them going forward? How does someone operate as a scout for, you know, these talent factories like the Chargers? Yeah, so uh, I didn't plan on getting this role with Oakley. It kind of just came out of the blue. So I was trying as the year was uh, as the year was going out, trying to get just information from people about, you know, how did some player test or uh, how to pronounce their name or something along those lines. <laughs> and uh, ha- happened to chat to Greg Truman at Oakley, who does some awesome stuff with player development there. He, I mean, he's... What, what he's doing now is something I definitely want to be able to do uh, for the long term because, yeah, it's uh, really rewarding just seeing how much he's had on some of these young players. So, yeah, he pretty much offered me the spot. He got uh, They had, you know, positions open for doing that kind of thing and thought uh, I, I did a pretty good job at it. So, yeah, when the opportunity came about, I, I, I thought I'd take it. I thought that it could also still help me get a a better role in the AFL just as much as, you know, doing what I was doing before, if not more so. So, uh, and even if it doesn't pan out that I, you know, get to do scouting or that for an AFL club, at least I'm getting a bit of reward out of it. It's a bit more rewarding actually having a a proper say in kids getting taken rather than, you know, just writing about them. It's a different kind of thing, which I think, yeah, is, is a lot more rewarding. Um, so that's really interesting, like potentially career aspirations for AFL club scouting and recruitment, which is probably what us as um, more like casual fans when it comes to draft are familiar with. Um, can you maybe share some of the differences between what um, scouts for clubs like the Chargers will look like um, to those of AFL clubs and, and how it's similar as well? Because I guess there's a lot of overlap between these two things. Yeah, I mean, it's fairly similar. I mean, uh what I'm still looking for at the end of the day is players that will become AFL, like AFL players. And it's just elite traits that you're going to be looking for, like their speed, their agility, their just football talent as well. Like some of them, you know, are a bit more advanced as their bodies like. I mean, there's some kids who are fully grown at, you know, 15 years old and there's others who are going to have massive growth spurt. So for one example is uh, Sam Darcy's younger brother, who's uh, going to be, yeah, uh, trying out for an Oakley spot. I mean, he's he's still fairly short, but if his brother's anything to go by, he's going to shoot up massively. So he's going to go from a, you know, a smallish wingman type to potentially a, a ruck. And that's something that you, you can only really get a sense of uh, for, for now, really. And um, the the biggest thing, I think, for young talls as well is that they, they're only growing into their body. So you're only trying to find one or two really good things that a, a tall player does and uh, try and teach them best you can because you'll actually find at a lot of the junior pathways that a lot of the taller kids, like they're not getting taught very well in terms of ruck craft and all those other things because you're getting a lot of these uh, junior coaches who are just kind of there to you know either do it for their son or they've been there for a long time. A lot of them probably midfielders or have grown up like that. So they probably don't understand it how to really teach and a, a young, taller player. So even if they're not absolutely dominating games, getting them into an elite system and seeing what they could do, I mean, that could be just as rewarding in itself. All right, awesome. That's that's really great. It's really interesting as well, actually. Um, it feels like this has definitely been more of a, like, recent trends, the shift towards finding elite traits rather than just best overall player. It seems like a methodology that's been like the trend in a lot of sports. I see it in American sports I follow as well, where it's um, yeah, not just necessarily looking for overall well-rounded players or anything like that. It's, it's um, finding almost like freak traits and seeing if you can develop them into something really unique or special and not worrying as much about weaknesses as, as um, people necessarily did in the past. Yeah. All right. Let's um, um, at, the, at the end of the day. Uh, sorry. At the end of on, the day, with yeah. um, with uh, the you know, if you're looking for a top end player, you're looking for the next star, really. So you've got to find what something that AFL teams don't have now, because that's going to be your next star. Like Nat, Nat Fife was the first of his kind. All these players are always the first of what they are. So uh, if you're going to have a high pick, you may as well really go all out and try and grab that type of player. It's also really interesting to see how player comparisons then evolve based on 
what um, like this last mold was. So, you know, once Nat Fife came through, everyone was in like the next Nat Fife or like the Patrick Dangerfield or the Dustin Martin comparison. It's just interesting to see how that evolves over time. And now you see a lot of like Crips or Bont looking for that big body tall mid. Um, yeah, really interesting to see how that like shifts in those trends over time. Let's um, let's shift to the draft itself and talk about that quickly. Um, I feel definitely a little bit uncomfortable talking to you about this as a topic, just given my knowledge is so cursory and limited. Um, but I'm really curious based on how it's kind of settled and now you've had time to think and reflect about it, uh, what teams you really liked or disliked um, uh, what they did on draft night based on their hand and the picks they had available. Yeah, the one thing I can't be is too critical, especially when it comes to, you know, for, for drafting talent-wise, because a lot of teams are after different things. And a lot of these, uh, like, I, I see so many of the same people from the clubs go to games and the amount of the work they put in and the amount of focus they put in there, uh, like you, you can't be too critical as an outsider of what they do there because these people are experts and they are absolutely love their craft. So uh, I can only go off my own own rankings of players. So when I see a player such as um, Ollie Hotton, who I rated as a top 15 pick, get picked by St Kilda at pick 35, then I look at St Kilda and go, oh, wow, that's, you know, that's a really good pick there. But then I look at the player they took ahead of him in Van Ness. Uh, I had him later in my in my rankings a bit. So it kind of just <laughs> evens out for me in that kind of sense. But uh, so when yeah, I looked at like, St Kilda's first three picks, by the way, like, so Philippou, I really love as a talent. Like that is the, I mean, I'm about to do the thing I just mentioned, but like that's the Bont comparison or the upside of someone like a, a Mateus. And I thought at pick 10, that's like value. And I thought the same thing as you, like Hotton, I would have had a head of Van S. But if you had have told me that someone would have taken Hotton at 31 and then Van S at 35, I would have said like, that's still really great value if you look at the package of those two things overall. I, like I think St Kilda did awesome with their first three picks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's not a lot of clubs when I go through it that I think, oh, yeah, they they probably reached for a few or this or that. Like, a, a lot of the players I thought did go where they were expected to go as well. Like, I didn't see there was many massive surprises. Like, the players that I had, like, some of them in the low, like, the high 20s, early 30s are the players that didn't get drafted. And at the end of the day, that happens every year. Like, you always get those hard luck stories where a kid just has a good year but just doesn't get picked up and they have to try through years a few years to get going but uh I so mean, just, just yeah at the end of the day i thought every club did pretty well so just on that those players that um seem to be gen like general consensus uh like early to mid second round and go undrafted is this um because there's something that like in general scouts at right media stuff has missed or is it things that have happened behind closed doors in maybe like interviews or personal situations that we're just not privy to that explain why this happens? It can have a lot to do with that type of, the type of player that they are. I mean, two players, for example, in Adam DeLoya and Mitch Sabowski, both are about that 186 centimetre mark. They're not overly quick, but they're good inside players. And now you look at... Um, how the game is evolving a bit. It's may, may not be going towards their type of player, even though those players at junior level are performing really well, getting 25 plus touches, 10 clearances, six, seven tackles. Like they're, they're putting in the work and you can see that they're really good at that level. But I guess other clubs are feeling, okay, we already have enough of this type of player. Uh, is this player going to come in straight away? And if not, maybe we can wait a bit longer because they're going to be the type of player we can just grab you know, at 23, 24, they're going to be even stronger. They'll be a bit more seasoned. We can more rely on that type of player. Whereas you will see guys with a lot of upside really go go higher. So that that's something that you've probably got to weigh up when you've got a mid-range pick as well. Do we address needs? You know, this kind of thing. So, yeah, so it, it's a tough spot in that type of area for sure. But those players I expect to be playing either VFL or sample league football. And yeah, they, they, it's not, you know, Nick Martin, for example, from for Essendon, he was another pretty good player at under 18's level, but just not quite there yet, but took a couple of years, played some Waffle seniors and then just comes out and does well. So uh, it's definitely not the end for those players, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I think the other thing that we take for granted a little bit with AFL is that a lot of these players are coming out in their you know, 18, 19 years old or, or even younger um, hitting these AFL lists. 
And you look at some of the American sports, it's not until they're they're like early 20s that they're ready to finish college and go on to these lists and play games. And it's sometimes those players that are missing out need the same thing. They need those extra three or four years development, go through kind of that next phase, and then you can really see that actually maybe they should have been drafted. And, and thankfully, there's still pathways to get picked up and um, play at the top level, even if you miss out on the draft. Um, so just quickly then, before we um, move to, I guess, the the part which my views have been interested in, which is like very much the super coach side of um, things, um, which which clubs did you like really like what they did with their draft hand? Was anyone um, else that kind of stood out to you as, um, you know, looking at your board and then looking who they ended up with that you, you really thought um, came out looking pretty good? I think so, someone like Melbourne getting a player like Jefferson at pick 15, I reckon he's a really dominant young key forward. He's going to take a long time to play. Like he's still years and years away, but he's a good value pick for them and just a perfect list need as well. Like a future forward, they've just lost Wiedemann, they've just lost Luke Jackson. So they're both still, they're players that, of course, Jefferson's going to take a bit longer, but, you know, in that time frame, by the time he's he's right to go, he could be a really good talent for him. And if he was to, say, get picked by, you know, an interstate club or another club with a pretty, already a lot of younger depth for, say, Essendon as well, like, it's probably just not quite the right fit. So not only have they done well in getting a player in that range, but also fitting a list need, which is very rare that you you get into a draft and just able to address something in a in a spot and get that get it really right. Um, and I guess uh, and the other one I, I, I liked just a pick in general, not more so the um, the whole clubs thing, but uh, Sydney p- putting that bid on. Um, on Rouston and taking the Giants out because they ended up being able to take the player that the Giants would have taken if they didn't do that. And Which that player Con- happens Constanti? to be a Tom Papley clone. Uh, yeah. Constanti, yep. yep. So it, it's just smart. Like, it, of course, they're not going to win any fans with it, but it's just really smart and how you really get the most out of, out of drafting, really. If you really want that player and you have the chance to get them, then... By all means, you got to do it. Yeah, I think like their their draft was really interesting, uh, and their their list manager is really interesting. But maybe that's a conversation for another time. Um, don't want don't want to get into the weeds of that. Um, all right, so let's let's shift gears to Super Coach. Um, so what we care about and what we look for, and Ed, you yourself play Super Coach, if I'm not mistaken. Excellent. Yep, so you're uh, across it all too well. Yep. Yep, perfect. All right. Um, so generally, the, the types of players we're looking for are big-bodied, mature, you know, ready-made. These are the types of words we we look for when we're reading draft profiles. Um, then we're we're kind of cross-referencing that with um, did they have high levels of production at junior level, both when it comes to like AFL fantasy or Supercoach scoring if it's available or disposal numbers. Do they look like their best twenty-two or fill a need in the club that they've kind of landed at? And then are they going to be playing a position or do you think they're ready to play um, a position that yields good super coach scores at at, um, uh, at AFL level? So things like halfback or midfield roles. Um, so when we kind of like rattle off some of these qualities, and I, I appreciate there's a fair few different ones in there, who are the types of players that come to mind that you think could really fit into those? Yeah, so as I was going through, I was going through you know the whole draft and pretty much ranked them out of 10 for how likely I think they'd be to, you know, fill all those types of needs. And the first one you've got to go with is, you know, Will Ashcroft. Again, his production has just been huge. But again, I probably don't expect him, like Dacos, he's not going to get straight away be put in that midfield and getting those big numbers from the midfield. So uh, Ashcroft may need to find it that he plays more at half back or more at half forward. Uh, I still expect him to score fairly well, and at pick at a pick two, he's going to be at a fairly you know pricey range somewhat. So two hundred K mark. Him, yeah, I, I wouldn't have him like as a ten out of ten like Rolls Royce type of selection, but uh, he's definitely one I would track for what position they will play him in because. It, I mean, I look at someone like a Dev Robertson that Brisbane have who has kind of played a little bit midfield and then sometimes half forward and has had to play a negating role at times. Uh, they might have to find that role for Ashcroft where he might have to, you know, sacrifice his game a little bit to allow the players that played his role in juniors, like your Lockie Neals, 
uh, he's not going to be able to do what he was doing then. So uh, that that's where you're you're going. He's going to be a good selection, but he's not going to. He he'll be someone that uh, in time you'll definitely be looking to trade out for you know a primo midfielder at that time. Yeah. Yeah, it, I guess um, it'll probably be a common theme. And if we compare everyone to Dacos, probably not going to have uh, too much luck in fighting another one. But um, it sounds like Ashcroft would maybe potentially have the scoring potential if he found the right role. But it's just really unlikely, given how stacked Brisbane's midfield is, that that role will exist for him. So seeing how they introduce him into that midfield rotation, but also what other role he plays will kind of come down to how successful he is. Yeah. Um, the next one I have down is uh, Cam McKenzie, who went to Hawthorne. So he's, uh, because Hawthorne, you know, they've cleared out a few midfielders, some of their ready-made ones, their midfield makeup is going to look very, very different next year. And I'm not sure if he will, you know, start round one. So, uh, and that goes for a lot of their other midfielders from their past drafts as well. I don't know what they're going to do with, say, a Finn McGuinness. Uh, is Josh Ward going to get more game time? You know, that kind of thing. Connor McDonald was another one. So it's it's hard to say, but... Uh, he might be one that you would probably look for depending on how he goes in the preseason. But I reckon if he does play each week, he'd probably be a good bet because he does find a bit of the ball. He's got a good mix of inside, outside, uses the ball really well and can play off a half forward flank if needed as well. Yeah, Uh, I definitely think a Hawks midfield and um, what they roll out round one and through the preseason is going to be very interesting because there's, so much young talent that are looking for opportunities. And you've also got people like Warple, who has kind of been played out of position um, with with Titch and stuff being there, Amira being there as well, like how they actually rotate this through, who takes over that midfield. Um, I'm hoping like Newcomb and Moore are still pretty heavily featured. But yeah, uh, of all this other young talent who actually comes through and takes takes the remaining CBA, it's going to be really interesting to watch. Yeah. Um, one of my top ones that I would definitely be looking at would be Oli Hollands. For, for the Blues, I reckon he'll be a plug and play on that wing for them. And I reckon he he will play most weeks. That That is w- what I'm thinking because his endurance is at an elite level. He can run all day. He's a good mover. Uh, he, he can play half back and half forward quite well. Uh, he's definitely not going to get, you know, those inside minutes. But that's probably to his advantage because he is such a good runner and can play on the outside. Uh, he, he's definitely one I'd be looking at fairly well. Uh, he's had some okay scores as well because even though he can play outside, he do, he is a willing tackler as well, mm-hmm. and just in general, just a good user of the ball. But uh, so the one thing with Holland's like I'd be worried about is they've brought in Blake Akers as well, um, who play opposite wing. I'm a little bit worried with someone like Holland's that they make him play fat side or like basically more defensive roles in year one. Is that a risk that you think we should be concerned with or are those the type of duties that will be shared between players? Um, If he does play a more defensive role, he's fairly good at mopping up usually when he does get back. So you can probably expect him to still get a fair bit of the ball just by getting back and linking because he's a very good link player as well by hand. He can kind of, you know, get a nice handball out and maybe get a little one, two here and there as well. So uh, he's definitely one I'm, I'm pretty high on my watch list. If he does, uh, you know, start to get a bit of game time in the preseason and yeah, because of his just elite endurance, he's one that could potentially, you know, not one who gets subbed out, you know, through the tactical side of things, or is even the sub in general, because he is such a really good runner. It'd be kind of a waste to use a player that can, almost pretty much win their 2k time trial at the club so yep um definitely one i'd be be looking at um for the rest of the first and second round there isn't really anyone that really really jumps out probably later in the piece uh joe richards who was picked up by collingwood as a later pick of course as a mature age player uh although he is on the smaller side he can play midfield he can play forward uh, he kicks goals he tackles uses the ball really well, uh, just seems like the type, especially for the price he'd be at. Uh, I, I think he'd be a very, very good selection. I think a lot of people will be trying to plug him in. Uh, can I go over some popular names and then get your opinions on those? Um, and I might start with uh, the two Chargers boys, actually, in Wardlaw and Sardis. So, you know, I guess the two um, premier uh, 
ball winning mids outside of Ashcroft um, and both playing, you know, in teams that kind of underperformed the last year. Um, you know, what do you see the the odds of them playing round one and, and in the midfield? What, what does that look like in your mind? Uh, the chances of both playing midfield, I'd say, are fairly low, uh, especially with the interrupted seasons they've had this year. And both of their endurance also isn't great. So that's something they've both definitely got to work on. They're, they're, they're very good athletes. They're very, they've got a lot of power about them and have got those eye-catching traits. But I wouldn't say it translates well to getting regular midfield time at AFL level. I mean, it's such a massive jump in in quality as well. So uh, they're ones I definitely do have on the lower end, especially for the price they're going to be at. Uh, and the high likelihood they do, you know, get uh, they're they're a sub or they get subbed out along those lines. Uh, yeah, they're as much as I rate their talent for in a few years' time for for next year, I, I probably wouldn't be be going after either unless unless the Wardlaw perhaps starts on a half forward line and could mm-hmm. play a role there because he has got a very good leap and you know that really good speed. He could play as a forward, but to, you know, to know to play each week, but I still don't know if he's going to be a high, a high score getter. Even if he does play that role, that's probably the other thing to look for. Um, yeah, and uh, like Sardis is an interesting one, and this is you know Essendon fandom coming into this question a little bit. Um, seen a few things about um, him playing more outside uh, this year, but you know also having pretty good, strong contested numbers. Is he someone that could play like a wing in? in year one, or is that really like um, kind of playing into some of his weaknesses around endurance base? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the modern game is really going hard towards your wingman being able to run all day. That's why you see players like Langford, Nick Martin and Cox at Essendon play on the wing because of their just high, you know, endurance players. And that is a big weakness of Sardis, even though he does, you know, get those real big high possession games uh, at AFL level to play wing uh, week in, week out. I just don't think he'd have the... Uh, he'd be one who would get subbed out quite often, I, I would say, if he does. So, uh, Or just be the sub in general so he can bring that burst and really give... So he might get, you know, subbed in with, you know, a quarter to go and get like 10 possessions and a few, maybe a few clearances and look really good in that amount of time. But... As someone is a week in, week out, uh, I just can't see it. And, and another one, Sam Durham as well, for yeah, who usually yeah. plays on the wing for us. And I just can't see him getting a game ahead of those guys on a wing. So, yeah, yeah, he's not one I'd recommend at the moment. Um, so last Sardis question, and then I promise I'll move on. Mm-hmm. Um, so when, when you see players that have this really high accumulation numbers, but then don't seem to have the endurance base that would match them running all day and getting a lot of this ball, especially um, when a, a large chunk of it is uh, uncontested or on the outside, what's going on here? Is it just um, a product of junior level play or is it um, exhibiting some trade around like IQ on where to run? Like what's, what, what am I missing? Uh, a lot of it, yeah, IQ on where to run. And for the most part as well, the quarters don't go for as long at the junior level as well. Like, I mean, to get those kind of possessions at a lower uh, at lower time is good enough in it, on its own. But uh, to, to, do, to do it at an AFL level is just completely different. It's just mm-hmm. like if he does play in a wing at junior level, he's going to get, you know, 35 possessions. But it's just not going to happen. You don't see many players getting that amount of the ball even at AFL level, because of the amount of running they have to do up and back, up and back. Like, it can't just be a, a fully attacking wingman these days. So he's going to have to do it in the midfield, and he, he's certainly not going to get a game a- ahead of the likes of Parrish, Shiel, Merritt, uh, uh, Hobbs and Caldwell, and a few of these guys going for the midfield yet. He's not going to do it yet, but give him another uh, another year or so, build up his tank and build up his strength then that's when you're going to really look for him to be. So maybe not, you know, this year, but uh, I mean, not this year, 2023, but 2024, if he doesn't play a lot of games, he might be one that you'd really look for if he has a, you know, massive mm-hmm. season in the VFL, improves his endurance. And then second year, he's the one you'd really look for. All right. And then just maybe to round out some of the top 10, um, Bailey Humphrey and Mateus Filippo both look like they're going to, suffer from the same problem when it comes to super coach scoring, which is that they're both damaging forward. So I could see them playing a lot of their first year in like a, 
half forward kind of dead super coach role position before uh, maturing and and maybe moving into the midfield more. Is that your read on the situation or? Uh, I'd say it's more likely Filippo will be able to score a bit more because he can play on the wing as well. And he does have good enough endurance to play that role. He can play more, say like Nick Martin, how he was able to be on the wing and then float forward and kick goals. That's how I would be using Filippo if you want to play him, you know, in the senior side at St Kilda. So, so, so he's one who's I'd definitely be on the look for if he's, you know, playing on the wing and looking really good in the preseason. Because yeah, at the price he'd probably be, there'd probably be pretty good value too. Uh, he's fairly durable. Uh, that's another thing you could look for. And yes. Uh, if they're going to be losing Max King for the early parts of the season, having players that can, you know, hit the scoreboard, whether they're on the wing or not, or half forward, I mean, it's going to be invaluable. Yep. Uh, and then um, Jai Clark seems like someone that might get games early for the Cats. Obviously hard to break into a premiership team, but it's just unlikely to be in the midfield um, and probably not conducive to a super coach scoring role. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say he's one that is a big, big scorer, even when he was playing some of his best games. I mean, he's a really strong tackler, so he gets a few numbers like that and fit, uses the ball fairly well. But he's not going to be that type that you you think hard super coach wise He's a player you're just going to, you know, in, in the long term think he's just a gun player, but he's not, you know, the super coach big scorer that you'd be looking for. And then um, Ruben Jinby looks like a really interesting prospect. I'm a little bit torn on this one because I I see some of the traits of like a interesting inside midfielder that could lead to really good scoring, but I also, um, you know, read in a lot of profiles that he's quite raw as a midfielder, has some versatility in terms of where he can play. Um, and then I look at West Coast list and I see a lot of aging injured midfielders. So I, I guess two questions. If West Coast is fit, where does he play on that team? And then secondly, if you've got some of these players like Yo or um, uh, Shui or Sheed or whoever, they're popping up with injuries again this year. Um, is Jinby the type that could actually score well in a midfield role if he gets that opportunity? Uh, he probably could, but he's still more of a... He's, he's fairly handball happy when he is in the midfield a little bit. He doesn't really get on the outside as much to really uh, get as much out of his score that he could. Uh, but I reckon he'd be a good one to to fit in just to play each week because he can play off the halfback as well. I mean, in you know four or five years' time, he's going to be that Jack Crisp player who can you know offer some drive off halfback or go into the midfield and still you know offer that and get a bit of the ball as well. So uh, he's definitely one to to wait and see on what role he plays early in the season because mm. I reckon there's a very high likelihood that if he does play most games it will be as a halfback but even yeah. then when he did play that halfback role playing waffle league football at the start of the year he was more of a more defensive so it's, so, like, it's not a, like a, a kicking wasn't like his strength like he's not a distributor out of halfback or anything like yeah. that i mean he could do that but you know if he's he's a young player you know at that 18s level this year just starting out playing you know league football they're going to ease him into it they're not going to have him be the main you know runner off half back, but uh, in time, he could definitely be that type of role. Um, all right. I think I've got one more question about players and then we might move on to some of the uh, viewer submitted questions ahead of time, which I've totally forgot to mention before, by the way, that that had happened. And I partly because I forgot. Um, all right. So the last question for me is, are there any recruits from last year's draft who you were quite high on who didn't debut that you think will debut or should debut this year that, that um, we should put on our watch lists? Uh, I'm not sure how his recovery is going from the injuries he had this year, but Campbell Chesser will probably be one that I'd really look for, you know, for West Coast because, you know, they're going to be starting to try and blood a lot of these younger players. Uh, Chesser can play wing. He can play half back. He can play so many roles because of his athleticism and his skill set. So he's one I would definitely look for potentially um uh kai loman might be one for brisbane he might be one who maybe gets a gig as say a, a half forward wing uh he's a really good marking target uh he's willing tackler as well uh i guess uh he only played a couple games at the end of the year but josh goda could could start to really get it get a handle in that north melbourne side and could be looked at uh 
Um, uh, Tyler Sonzi might have a stronger hand uh, as a, even though they've brought in Hopper and um, and uh, and Taranto, they're going to be playing more inside. And if they want to really develop someone to play a more outside, classier role, Sonzi could play week in, week out. And if he's getting, you know, those big, bigger guys releasing him and he's your player that's kicking inside 50 and even kicking goals as well, uh, he could be a, a good value type of player. Um a lot, of, a lot of the other ones here, they probably just need to see how they track along. Uh, I guess uh, Josh Fay for GWS, he might get a gig here or there, but they've got a pretty good young half-back line going, going through. Uh, nah, I, I reckon that, that that's it at the moment. There's not many here that really strike me as ones who are going to you know, come, come in and just all of a sudden really show a bit. Um, I guess I could go go through the uh, the rookie picks that we had this year as well. I don't think I really went through some of the rookies that got taken. So you can tell me how Mankara is going to become the best yeah, thing since sliced bread. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, he's definitely won't be one who will play next year. But uh, yeah, very exciting talent. But um, yeah. In, ter- in terms of uh, in, in terms of rookies, they're probably the only ones you'd really look for are the the rucks that got taken that you can kind of use as a loophole, I guess. Um, I mean, there's a few that were taken there, but you know, there's a few at Fremantle, and you know, they've got Luke Jackson who's just come in, and you've still got and you know, some of those players there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's going to be tough for a few of those boys, but um, yeah, in terms of last year's one, there's not not many that really. Uh, I guess maybe you look at Charlie Dean again if he gets gets through. I mean, he was pretty unlucky with injury last year. Uh, this year is one to watch. But, uh, you know, if he gets his body right, he could be one to look for. Uh, yeah, that, that, that'd be all I could think of at the moment. Okay, excellent. All right, we'll get on to some of the fan questions. And the first one's going to test um, how young a division I think you actually watch and, and get names for ready. But it's from... At Benny G, and the question is, which McLean brother do you think is more likely to go number one in the draft, Hunter or Jonah? So I don't know if you're familiar with Hunter and Jonah McLean. Uh, if if I was to assume a McLean, I would assume the one who used to play for Carlton. Uh, if if that is the case, I'm not too sure. I don't think I've seen any of the any of the McLeans play yet. They might just be a little bit too young at that level, or just haven't been exposed enough. I think they're but, uh, like. 12 and 10. So yeah, uh, it might, Xavier, be, it might so, be a little bit young. Yeah. So uh, this comes back to, I guess, some of the questions earlier. What age range do you normally start looking at um, talent? Uh, under 15s is where we look. Sometimes in, in rare cases where there's under 14s playing up and we just don't know that they're playing up into under 15s, that's when we maybe see a few there. But yeah, for, for the most part, you kind of just focus on the 15s. It's a bit you know, there's so much that can change with kids between 10 and... But you do actually find a lot of gun under 12s end up being very good players. I mean, Nick Dacos, Sam Darcy, uh, Matt Rowell, those kids dominated under 12s and then it went up to, you know, dominate uh, later on. So uh, even though you can pick them that early, we, we just kind of just focus on the 15s and 16s. All right, well, then Hunter Jonah McLean for the watch list for the future then. Um, all right, so who uh, was the highest rated player outside of the first round that you had? Uh, I would say, yeah, Ollie Hotton is, is one and, and Braden George who went to North at uh, pick 26. So those two I had as top 15 talents and, yeah, they, they definitely went a bit further. I mean, uh, Braden George will miss all of next year with, with that ACL he suffered at the end of this year, which is really unfortunate for him, but... I mean, he could have been a top 10 player. So North Melbourne getting him that late's really good. And yeah, Ollie Houghton has some really explosive traits, can play forward and midfield. I reckon he could be like a Zach Bailey type of player. So I think Saints have got a really good player there as well that late. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of the players I expected to go fairly high went fairly high. And which player um, uh, outside of Ashcroft do you believe the most likely to make an impact? Or oh, sorry, yeah, outside of Ashcroft, who will make the biggest impact next year when it comes to the rookies? I, I reckon Hollands. I, I still, even though that yeah, Carlton got acres in, I reckon Hollands will play quite a bit of senior football. Uh, I guess 
I don't know if you count like a Joe Richards because he isn't, you know, like an under 18, under 19 type. But um, I think the ones with the most potential, you know, McKenzie, uh, especially with Hawthorne's list there. Um, and later picks, maybe a uh, Kobe Bajil or um, Harvey Gallagher. Uh, Bajil's another one with really good endurance and is going to West Coast. So he may get a few games there. Uh, Gallagher's a 19-year-old. He could do... Uh, he could come in pretty early. But again, the Bulldogs usually really like to make kids wait for their chance to play. So he might be one to track later on. And um, I know he's, you know, a tall and he's at pick one, but Cadman uh, could be a regular player regardless of, you know, regardless if he's ready or not. I mean, he's got really good endurance. He gets up the ground, takes a lot of marks, can play on a wing as well. So, uh I, I'd be shocked if Cadman isn't playing more than half of the games in the AFL. So uh, they're probably the ones who will have, you know, impact, but whether they have a super coach impact or... No really yeah, we're, we're starting to blur, but yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 really interesting. Um, another question here, which I think we've touched on a little bit, but let's go over again. So what traits make someone good early on in their career? Um, and why do some higher draft prospects take a while to come on apart from obvious things like having a mature body already and, and those types of things. Yeah. Uh, the ones who tend to really start well are the ones that, uh, you know, having, having a strong endurance base always helps because it just helps you adjust that bit easier at the next level. Speed is another thing that really helps a lot of them adjust. So if you're like a slower player or like most tools, like adjusting to the next level is very, very difficult. I mean, uh, I mean, Dacos isn't super quick, but again, he's a player that uh, has been ment mentally and physically fairly mature early on. Uh, so like under 16s, under 17s, he, he looked like he could play senior football. Same as like a Matt Rao. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these players that take a little bit longer that are starting to do well, I mean... Uh, now, Dangerfield and Fife, they took a while because they still needed to gain the, the necessary body strength to play the roles that they would be good in later on. So a player like Sardis and Wardlaw, they're going to take a, a little bit longer to to do that because they don't have that. They're not fully you know, built yet. Then they're, they're not got enough endurance yet. Whereas players that, you know, like Dacos, like Rao, like McGrath, they're like smaller players w with, with burst who can, you know, play a range of roles. That also really, really helps clubs be confident that a player will come in and, and play because they can kind of play a lot of positions. And, you know, if something's not working, you can kind of move them. Whereas if one kid's just can only play one position, uh, it, it kind of makes it tough because they're having to battle it out with all these other mature players that do play in those positions. And a coach is always going to have more trust in what they know and what they already have. Great, very comprehensive response. And thank you so much. Um, I, I feel like I've taken up so much of your time, but it's been really insightful to me. Um, I've learned a lot about drafting and recruitment, but also the players for next year. I think the one that's probably moved up my list most rapidly is um, Ollie Hollands with your, your um, big raps for him and his endurance base. So yeah, really excited for how these rookies turn out. As I'm sure you are as well. Um, but once again, Ed, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your insights. It's been a really great learning from you. Yeah, no, it's uh, great to be on. And uh, yeah, ho hopefully a, a lot of what I could put out here uh, will help uh, next year. Just got to hope some of these kids don't get injured. <laughs> yeah, that's always the worst case. So fingers crossed um, yeah. that they stay healthy. All right. Thanks all. And I'll see you in the next one.